Throughout the religious history of America, few figures have been as influential as Jonathan Edwards. Though he wrote his works during the height of Puritan America, the effects of his writings can still be felt today. Jonathan Edwards was a, an American pastor, theologian, philosopher before the American Revolution. Jonathan Edwards was uh, a pastor, he was a theologian, he was a missionary, and he was alive in the 18th century. Uh, contributed significantly to our understanding of God and spiritual experience. I think it's fair to say that all of Christianity, all of Christianity has been affected in some way or another by Edward's um, love for the centrality and glory and magnificence of God in all things. Edwards was a pastor in Northampton, Massachusetts, where he pastored a church that was previously pastored by his grandfather. And Edwards Church had um, been experiencing some interesting moves of what we would consider a sort of move of the Holy Spirit. And this kicked off a period in American religious history called the Great Awakening. The first Great Awakening saw a massive Christian revival in colonial America with sermons given by pastors like Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield drawing large crowds. Edwards is probably most famous for his sermon that he preached, uh, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, which led uh, to a huge spiritual revival in the New England area. It became popular in the 20th century to portray Jonathan Edwards in terms of one sermon he gave in uh, 18th century rural Massachusetts. And, and then you portray him in a certain light that wasn't entirely accurate. Edward's sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, has been largely viewed in the 21st century as a speech of fire and brimstone based on its vivid and violent language, and for good reason. Your wickedness makes you as it were heavy as lead, and to tend downwards with great weight and pressure towards hell. And if God should let you go, you would immediately sink and swiftly descend and plunge into the bottomless gulf, and your healthy constitution, and your own care and prudence, and best contrivance, and all your righteousness, would have no more influence to uphold you and keep you out of hell than a spider's web would have to stop a falling rock. I think one has to understand what it would be like to live in rural Massachusetts in 1730, and what people are used to hearing. What what kind of rhetoric makes them pay attention. So Edwards would use images and scripture, but images that they would be familiar with to, to help them understand the scripture. And the distorted picture is this crazy man yelling and his veins on the side of his neck, you know, <laughs> extending. Edwards was not like that. He was calm, quiet, confident in God. While the language used in Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God was harsh, the truth behind Edward's theology was much more loving. Edwards held to the authority of God over everything and believed that God was deeply involved in the happenings of the world, especially through creation. Jonathan Edwards held um, a very strong view of the sovereignty of God and God's power and God's greatness and God's majesty. And this was in a time period when, uh, you know, religious experience or, um, you know, affect type of experiences with the divine were looked upon with skepticism. Reason was the preferred way of understanding God through the intellect, through reason and through logic. Edward's spirituality clashed with many other theologians' use of deism, rationalism, and logic that were becoming increasingly popular at the time. One such theologian that would have a profound effect on Edwards was Baruch Spinoza. Spinoza was a, a Jewish philosopher in the 17th century in Holland, and he uh, became famous for being an atheist. And some say that he um, that he wasn't particularly an atheist so much as a pantheist, that uh, nature is God, God is nature. 
you know, in this 17th, 18th century, you know, the theological question of the day was why did God even create to begin with? You know, why is there a creation? So Spinoza wanted to speak specifically into that one question of God had to create because he needed something he didn't have. And so Spinoza said, if there's an end in creation, if God had some reason to create, some end that he needed to achieve, then that alone would declare that God was insufficient in some way, that there was something that God didn't have. And that would speak against in the doctrine, um, you know, the doctrine of God in the systematic theology that would speak against God's immutability. Spinoza's claims against the perfection of God were backed behind reason and logic, making it increasingly popular to rationalists and deists. In Spinoza's The Ethics, he writes, Further, this doctrine does away with the perfection of God, for if God acts for an object, he necessarily desires something which he lacks. Certainly, theologians and metaphysicians draw a distinction between the object of want and the object of assimilation. Still, they confess that God made all things for the sake of himself, not for the sake of creation. They are unable to point to anything prior to creation except God himself as an object for which God should act and are therefore driven to admit, as they clearly must, that God lacked those things for whose attainment he created means, and further that he desired them. This issue Spinoza presented resonated with Edwards given his intense belief in a supreme, all-knowing God. Despite the fact that Spinoza had died a century before, Edwards became determined to challenge this belief. Um, there's a lot of evidence that Jonathan Edwards became aware of Spinoza through the writings of others uh, gradually throughout his life, in particular uh, in his late 30s. Well, the, the two men didn't know each other, so Edwards had access to Spinoza's writings, and so he knew that if, if he was going to engage in this conversation theologically, that he would have to overcome Spinoza, because, because, because Spinoza's understanding of the immutability in God kind of won, won the day, it kind of won the argument of the day. He did say in one place that he thought that the writings were, uh, this is implied in what he says, that they were distorted and obviously, obviously wrong. Edwards knew that for, for any uh, conceptual framework of answering the question, why did God create the world, he would have to somehow address Spinoza's claims that God couldn't have had an end at all. Edwards' determination resulted in what became known as the Dissertations, culmination of his own philosophy, theology, and spiritual understanding that he had collected in the past 30 years. For the rest of his life, Edwards refined this piece of work in an effort to disprove Spinoza. Edwards had begun writing on um, God's end in creation or God's purpose in creation and God's motive for creation early on in his life, and he kept little notes of these in, a, in his journals called miscellanies. And so that was what one of the one of the reasons why Edwards wanted to write the dissertations one and two concerning the end for which God created, because he felt he had something. He felt he had uh, an insight from God in terms of, well, yes, God can create with an end in mind, and it doesn't it doesn't logically entail that God had an insufficiency. The result of Edwards' work was a complete refutation of Spinoza using the same kind of logic and reason that was becoming so popular to disprove all of his arguments. Though complicated, the dissertations provided proof that carefully and logically dismantled all of Spinoza's claims against the Christian doctrine. Edwards overcame Spinoza by rooting and grounding the end of creation in the being of God himself, which has existed eternally and um, cannot be added to because it is not only eternal but it's infinite. Edwards' argument was as follows. God, who is infinitely valuable, is capable of valuing things infinitely. Thus, it follows that God would value himself infinitely, serving as his own end in creation, rather than gaining anything he did not yet have, as Spinoza originally claimed. In the dissertations, he wrote this. If God himself be in any respect properly capable of being his own end in the creation of the world, then it is reasonable to suppose that he had respect to himself as his last and highest end in this work, because he is worthy in himself to be so, being infinitely the greatest and best of beings. All things else, with regard to worthiness, importance, and excellence, 
are perfectly as nothing in comparison of him. And therefore, if God esteems, values, and has respected things according to their nature and proportions, he must necessarily have the greatest respect to himself. It would be against the perfection of his nature, his wisdom, holiness, and perfect rectitude, whereby he is disposed to do everything that is fit to be done to suppose otherwise. So Edwards was, Edward's success in his time was minimally successful, it was a minimal amount, uh, mainly, I think, because at least the dissertation itself where he talks about this was so hard to understand. Um, it took about 250 years or so, you know, for, for scholars to realize that, you know, that this, that this theologian, pastor, missionary put Spinoza to rest, but it, Edwards went unnoticed in the theological literature, in the theological circles for many, many years, for centuries. And so uh, it only has been recently that the Spinoza conundrum, if you will, has been put to rest. Despite being a figure from the 18th century, Edward's works are still being studied today. His writings have been so impactful that they have remained influential both to churches and historians alike. Edward's interest is growing all over the world. There are more PhDs written on Edward's work outside of the United States than inside the United States. There are Jonathan Edwards centers growing up all over the world. His um, insistence on an authentic relationship with the divine and also his insistence upon grounding that faith in scripture though those two concepts were really the foundation for what we would consider modern you know evangelical christianity and then some of the more um you know charismatic and pentecostal movements so edwards his theology and of course the experiences that happened in his churches were really the foundation for those movements that came in the next centuries after. Edwards' writings and teachings have been extremely influential to American Christianity and are still studied and analyzed today. Whether studying his difficult dissertations against Spinoza, viewing his messages during the Great Awakening, or analyzing his personal thoughts on God and creation in the miscellanies, it is easy to see the colossal influence Edwards has attributed to Christianity, both in the past and in the present.